All right, I'm back. I've got another phylum that I want to talk to you about very briefly. These are also worms, but instead of segmented worms, these are the round worms, nematoda, or the nematodes. So as I just said, um, the Anelida had the segmented worms. These are smooth worms, uh, which we call the round worms. Now, this is a really important group, especially if you're in medicine or if you're going to, uh, if you're in human medicine or veterinary medicine, the round worms are important because they cause many diseases in humans and livestock, but they're also important as far as causing disease in plants. Now, earlier when we talked about the integument, we talked about a cuticle, and I showed you how a cuticle develops, and you remember that a cuticle um, is an exoskeleton. It's hard on the outside, and so it must be molted as they grow, and these worms have that cuticle. But having that hard exoskeleton, again, can be used as sort of a hydrostatic skeleton, and influences their movement. And whereas the segmented worms had that circular muscle and longitudinal muscle, we saw how uh, those two coordinate to make the segmented worm move. The round worms only have the lateral muscle. And they can't, they don't have that circular muscle, but they don't have segments, so they really wouldn't use it. So they have that lateral muscle, so they can only go left and right, and they have a very characteristic whip-like movement. And so if we look here, uh, you can see in this cross-section, go back and compare that to the earthworm cross-section, and, and you can see these muscles that line the inside of that cuticle, and they just run the length of the worm. And so you can track to one side, and the worm moves to that side, and you can track the other side, and it moves to that side. So let's look at a video of this. And that's the characteristic whip-like motion of a round worm. Okay. Um, and there's lots of examples of these. I just want to hit on a few that were in your book or a few that are commonly known. Uh, the large round, the large human round worm, uh, potentially... Uh, 1.27 billion people are infected with this. And the eggs of this worm lives in the soil, can live a long time in the soil. They're very tough. And this is how the infection can be transferred to a human, is by ingesting the eggs, by uh, ingesting soil or maybe unwashed vegetables. And why would the eggs be in the soil? Often that has to do with poor sanitation. And so if human feces uh, gets in contact to the ground and the humans are infected with this round worm, and then the eggs get transferred to another human. Now, how they travel around your body is pretty interesting. So you swallow the eggs, and the eggs hatch, and the juveniles are in your intestines, but they will burrow out and get into the bloodstream or get into the, the lymph vesicles and move around. This particular one will go to the heart and to the lungs. Then it will break out of the, the alveoli in your lungs and move up to the trachea, and it can po possibly cause pneumonia at this stage. But somehow they get back up, and mo a lot of these roundworms do this. They get back up, they get into your trachea, uh, they cause you to cough a lot, you cough them up, and then you swallow them. And that's how they get back down into your intestines. And so the juveniles do that, and then the adults grow in your intestines, and of course, then they produce eggs, and the eggs leave in your feces. Um, and they also might, potentially, if they break loose, they might um, wander and crawl out of your anus or crawl out of your mouth, which is very cool. Here's just an example. This is a very closely related round worm to the one I just mentioned that infects pigs and you can see that heavy infestations of these in your intestines you can imagine that can be um, bad for the infected individual and they can get so thick it can really 
block your intestines. And of course I found a cool video and so this is a video of a colonoscopy where they have found a round worm inside a human's colon. And you can see the ridges of cartilage there in the colon and you can see the round worm just hanging out doing his thing and at some point in this video they actually capture it and start pulling it out I don't know if we're gonna watch it that long oh, here we go I see they got this thing and they're going to lasso it it'll stick its head down and yeehaw there they got it so I'll go ahead and pull it out like I said, this is, uh, you know, potentially 1.27 billion people are infected with this. Okay, um, another round worm that's very common is uh, Toxicara canis, and there's also a Toxicara cati, I believe. For This is for dogs, and the cati, of course, is for cats. And um, very common infection in dogs and cats. So, an infected adult dog will often have these, but they will kind of, um, they won't develop fully. They'll be sort of stuck in the juvenile stage. And so they don't develop, and, you know, the adult's immune system is stronger, perhaps. But if um, an infected bitch gets pregnant, then this seems to stimulate them to begin developing again. And so her puppies can actually get infected with it. It's been dormant in her body for a long time. Also, maybe from her milk, this can happen too. And so puppies are often um, infected with this. And they're a common source of transferring it to humans. Um, again, you have soil ground that uh, has puppy feces on it that has the eggs in it and accidentally ingesting those. Uh, you know, if you have the puppies in your house, you don't clean up after them or as you're cleaning up after them. So this is potentially one way that this roundworm can be transferred to humans. And so this is, again, a reason why you take your puppies to the vet after they're born. Um, and you have to be aware of this when you're um, taking care of them. One of the consequences of being infected with this, uh, it can cause several different things in humans. But one of these diseases is called ocular, ocular toxocariasis. And um, there are several ways to diagnose this, but you see uh, a very common effect of having this roundworm infect your eye is a granuloma. And a granuloma just seems to be, it's kind of like scarring that's left behind by... Um, some sort of infection and if you look at this picture you can see this is supposedly this is the char very characteristic of someone with this infection is that in the back of their eyeball they have this white long granuloma which I presume is where the worm had burrowed and, and caused damage and, and that scarring in the back of the eye and um, I, I think it's probably something that if caught can be remedied pretty easily, but also um, does sometimes cause blindness. Another type of nematode, very similar, the hookworms. And they have very similar life cycle. Um, they infect by burrowing through the skin, though, not by ingesting the eggs so much. And they've got this is not the hook part. This is just something that they use to hold on to the intestine. It's the other end. I think it's the posterior end. I know one end of them has like a characteristic hook in it. There's a figure from your book. And again, it sort of shows you that route that they take. So you see if you um, start at uh, A, you've got the eggs that are passed in the feces and develop and here that the eggs are hatching outside the body and developing in the soil and then they burrow through the skin so a lot of times you get these by walking barefoot over contaminated soil and so then here F 
the juveniles migrate through the circulatory system and get to the lungs, and this causes them to, um, they, they break out of the alveoli, and you cough them up. Um, and let's see. Oh, then, then uh, cough them up and then swallow them, and that's how they get back down into your intestine where the adults develop and then produce eggs, and that's the cycle there. Now, there's an interesting story I'd like to tell you about hookworms and hygiene, and um, I don't want to get into this too much, but it is very interesting. So there's this thing that's called the hygiene hypothesis. That's kind of the catchy term for it. And it's this general idea that explains why our uh, rate of allergies is so high, for example, in this country and other more developed countries. The idea is, is that as sanitation improves, our immune systems are not properly challenged because our sanitation is improved. We clean things up. And so we're not exposed to a lot of different um, parasites. But because they're not challenged as much, and especially when you're little, when they do get challenged, when you do get a foreign object in your body, your immune system overreacts to it. And an overreaction can be called an allergy. And, of course, it's much more complicated than this, but that is the general idea. And it sort of grew from this idea that if you look at the rate of allergies in countries that have better sanitation, you know, allergies are much higher, uh, but other diseases are much lower, right? There's almost kind of a trade-off there. And so that's sort of the hygiene hypothesis in a nutshell. But there's, you know, there's a lot to it, and there's, well, you know, I, I don't want you to think that it's that simple, uh, but I want you to be aware of this idea. Um, and so the idea here is that if you have the proper flora and fauna in your gut, again, we're looking at all those organisms that live in your stomach. Um, if they are, if you have the proper community of those species in your stomach, that they properly um, tune the, uh, the immune system. And that's a terrible word, tune, but you get the idea. Because your body uh, recognizes them as foreign, and perhaps it doesn't overreact whenever it is exposed to um, non-lethal pathogens. Again, there's a lot more to this, and I'm no expert on this, but this is the general idea. Um, again, some people consider all those organisms that live in your intestines as the microbial organ, like it's an organ system, because it does things for you like other organs of your body do. And, um, and so, this is an interesting idea. Well, based upon this idea and looking at some anecdotal evidence and things, there are people that um, are using, are purposely infecting themselves with hookworms in order to cure other diseases. For example, if people look at multiple sclerosis, which is kind of an autoimmune disease, or Crohn's disease, they've studied this. And the idea is, is that uh, these hookworms, we used to be infected with them, uh, or if you have poor sanitation, you have more hookworm infections, but you don't have nearly as much uh, immune system, autoimmune system disease. And so they're looking at using these hookworms and purposely infecting them, adding them to the flora of your gut. Um, and... So this is an interesting idea, and it has been, there have been some tests, and the tests weren't quite successful, so they're starting to look at this. Here's the thing. This is a very interesting idea, and, you know, I think it's worth considering and knowing about, but, you know, if you look online, this is a classic example of somebody having just enough information to be dangerous, and people who are proponents of the hook, the hookworm treatment, you know, it cures everything, and it's a miracle, and, and this is unbelievable. 
And I think it gets traction because it is a very interesting thing. Like you're being infected and it does seem to improve it. Now, it, you know, there's some anecdotal evidence that it works and, and there's a very interesting idea. However, um, just like anything else, you need to take it with a grain of salt and you need to be smart about it. And the best way to find out if this truly works or under what conditions this works is by controlled scientific studies. These have the best track record of, uh, you know, understanding these kind of treatments. And so I want you to be smart about this. I don't want you to go and say that your professor told you that, oh my God, we should get infected with hookworms because you know you get infected with hookworms, you can, that, that itself could be a bad disease. I'm not telling you that. I'm not telling you that it doesn't work. I'm saying that it's an interesting idea and it deserves further study, but don't get too excited by what you read on the internet. Just like everything else. Okay. But, um, you know, there are proponents of this. There's a guy who's a big proponent of this who sells his feces so that people can somehow ingest his feces and ingest the eggs and infect themselves. All right. I'm just telling you, there's people that do that. It's a very interesting idea. Okay. Um, another nematode you may be familiar with, trichinella, uh, causes trichinella, uh, excuse me, causes trichinosis. Uh, this is um, common with eating, you get this commonly from eating undercooked meat, undercooked pork is what's where you commonly get this. Uh, the infected organism the muscle cells get reprogrammed and actually manipulated so that they stop doing what they're supposed to do and they, in, they instead turn to a cell to nourish the nematode. Pretty interesting. Um, another type of nematode that infects humans are pinworms. Very common infection. These are interesting in that um, the female will migrate to the anus and lay eggs around the anus. And so this is transferred not so much by eggs developing in soil due to bad sanitation, but the eggs are laid around the anus, it irritates it, you scratch it, your hand becomes contaminated, your bed sheets become contaminated, and that's how it gets uh, transferred to different humans. Um, one of the interesting things uh, that your book talks about as far as diagnosing pinworms in humans um, is the scotch tape method where you press scotch tape up against someone's anus and then look at that under a microscope to see if you can see the pinworm eggs. Again, for those of you who are thinking about going to med school and you think it's all going to be like Grey's Anatomy and good-looking doctors doing heart transplants, most of it is, you know, pressing scotch tape up against someone's anus. I'm, you know, that's, God bless them for doing it. I just want you to be aware that's what most of medicine is. It's fascinating, but that's reality. All right, um, I think the last type of worm we're going to talk about here, round worm we're going to talk about, are these uh, filarial worms that um, cause elephant uh, elephantiasis. Some people call it elephantitis. Um, dog heartworms are another common one that you may have run into. Um, these use mosquitoes as a vector. You know, the others, we had contaminated soil or the eggs got transferred somehow. Here, the mosquitoes are actually transferring the roundworm. And again, you see the life cycle of the mosquito bites an infected human and then transferred it to another human. I think repeated, if you get beat, bitten, by infected mosquitoes repeatedly, that's what tends to cause uh, elephantiasis. Uh, you see that these things tend to congregate at the lymph nodes. So whereas the other roundworms we were looking at concentrated like in the intestines, it could maybe block the intestines, these concentrate in these lymph nodes and block the lymph nodes. And then that's what causes this characteristic swelling because the lip can't drain. And so that's how you're getting this elephantitis. And I also said that dog heartworms are um, the same type of roundworm. And so here you see a dog heart 
that's been cut open and you can see the worms in it. Here's a, another picture that I found. Um, and of course, again, this is a, a very common, very serious problem in dogs. And that's why most dogs take medicine to avoid this because you can imagine if your heart is full of this nematode, then it's not functioning very efficiently. Okay, well that was the exciting world of nematodes. Uh, that's all I have for this group. If you have any questions, please let me know.